Thank you for watching Concord United on YouTube. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest videos. If you'd like more information about our church, please visit concordunited.org. We hope you will take advantage of our many opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. It's wonderful to be with you today as we continue our August message series, which is Why Worry? And we talk about how sometimes worry can run our lives, and God never intended it to be that way. So we're looking at Jesus' teachings about worry and how we can apply them to our lives during the next month. God intended worry to be basically a warning light, a check engine light that causes us to respond in a way that will ultimately allow us to live a life of joy and peace. Uh, but sometimes we allow it to cause us to just dwell in that worry and it has disastrous consequences for us. So we're looking together at the end of the scriptures for how God uh, wants us to respond to those times when we worry. And I hope that we'll continue looking together into the scriptures, not just uh, for a few moments together on a Sunday morning, but also throughout the week, I'd encourage you be a part of our daily Bible reading plan. The uh, Passages can be found at concordunited.org slash Bible, or we have printouts for the reading plan for August at our information center. Be sure to pick one of those up. Read over those, pray over them. By the way, remember, if you're around, if you have some free time during the middle of the day, if you're in the area, this space is open for half an hour each day from noon to 1230 for silent prayer, and it's just a gorgeous space to, to come and, and seek God, and would encourage you to, to read every day, and if you're around, join us uh, for, for prayer here. I think that will help these scriptures uh, become more than uh, just something that the pastor talks about for 30 minutes on a Sunday. Actually, some of you are hoping for well less than 30 minutes. We'll see uh, how, how, how that goes and into something that's really transformative, uh, that really changes and blesses your life. So I hope, hope you'll be a part of that. Uh, last week, we talked about how do we handle worry in general? And we looked at some of Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, don't worry about tomorrow. And we asked, how in the world is, is that possible? And we, we saw how it was possible. For the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at very specific things we worry about. Today, we're going to be talking about time. Next week, we're going to be talking about money. The week after that, we'll be talking about relationships. How do we not spend all our time worrying about those things? And, and when we do worry, how do, how do we respond in a helpful way? Well, Today, as we look at time, I'm aware that there's very few things that get us as irritated as when someone criticizes or questions the way we spend our time. It probably gets us as or more irritated than even if somebody was to talk about what, what we do with our money. When somebody comes up and says, you should do this, you should do that. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? We're, we're often thinking, I, I mean, how do you know everything I have to do? How do you know all my responsibilities? How do you know everybody who's, who's counting on me? Who are you to say that to me? And we know who that person is to say that to us her name is mom, right? Um, and actually, moms aren't the only ones who say those kind of things. I'm aware I'm guilty of, of that sometimes. I have these things I want my children to accomplish in school. And sometimes I say, well, during this time of day, just make sure you do this. Or just make sure you do go by this office and take care of this. And they'll say, dad, you don't understand. You don't understand everything we have to do. You don't understand how it works at our school. And I probably don't. I, pr I probably don't at all, and they're feeling it exactly what I've felt. Uh, this deal with, with time and, and how we handle it and what to do when, when we don't feel like there's enough of it. I want to ask you some questions. What's, what's your biggest stressor when it comes to time? Uh, are you someone who, who feels like there aren't enough hours in the day uh, when, when it comes to time? For, for you that, that you have all these things and you just don't know how to get it done and it seems like you go to bed uh, and you wake up uh, and you work hard but then when you go to bed the next night uh, you've got even more things on your list than, than you had the day before before you even started working or uh, do you worry about uh, spending your time wisely do you feel like how you're spending your time is in line with your beliefs your priorities or do you feel like there are these invisible forces uh, kind of controlling your calendar, pushing you to spend your time these ways, but it's not really what you see or, or what you want or what you desire? Are you, do you struggle with procrastination? And some, sometimes that can be one of the greatest struggles we have because uh, we fear making a decision or doing something, so we put it off, but then we just allow that worry to 
to live rent-free inside of us. And so Jesus has something to say about that. Uh, again, uh, when we do worry about time, uh, he's nudging us, telling us that this worry, it's a warning sign. And it needs a response. Uh, in his Sermon on the Mount, uh, the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, as we read last week, he tells us this. He says, and which of you, of you by worrying can add a single hour to your span of life? That we can worry all about this, but it doesn't add an hour to our life. In fact, if we keep on worrying about it, it takes hours away. Uh, they've documented medical studies uh, that that worry has significant effects uh, on our heart, on our blood pressure, on our, our chances of having a catastrophic health event. And Jesus is saying, you know, that's, that's not the case. There's, there's a better way. Now, when Jesus taught, he often quoted the Psalms. In fact, in Jesus' day, uh, when not everyone could read, uh, it was common that they would actually memorize all of the Psalms. One of the Psalms that Jesus would have memorized would have been Psalm 90. And Psalm 90 talks a lot about time. I want to share with you a couple verses from Psalm 90 uh, that would have been familiar to Jesus. And then we're going to talk about how can we look at what these verses teach us, look at how Jesus lived his life and ordered his time, and then what we are to do with our time. Uh, we're going to pick up with verse 10 in Psalm 90. The length of our days is 70 years or perhaps 80 if we are strong. Even then their span is only toll and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. So teach us to count our days that we might gain a wise heart. Teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. How can we count our days that we may gain a wise heart. I remember uh, when I was in college, uh, we used to save our pennies and we'd want to go out on Friday or Saturday night and go to a restaurant. We'd eat in the school cafeteria the rest of the week and we had a perfectly good meal plan, but we just wanted to go out on Friday or Saturday and we wanted to go out to a restaurant. So my friends and I, we, you know, we, we'd save our money and then sometimes we, we'd joke around uh, because, you know, we, we'd we wouldn't get to the restaurant till like seven or eight or, or, or later. Uh, but in the afternoon when we were still r running around, uh, you know, we'd, we'd see these folks several generations our senior and it'd be like 4.45 and they're dressed and ready for dinner, right? And they're on their way to the restaurant and we'd just pick at them and we'd laugh and we'd say, oh my goodness, they haven't even digested lunch yet. How could they want to go to, you know, di dinner so early? And then a couple... Uh, months ago, I got together with some of my college buddies, and about 4.45, someone was like, you know, if we get to the restaurant between 5 and 6, the appetizers are free. And uh, somebody else brought up, yeah, and, and then we can still get to bed at a reasonable hour. A and I realized when I, that those older folks when I was in college, like, they weren't showing us a way of life to, to fear in our coming years. They were giving us a master class, right, on how to have a wise heart and how to, how to manage your time, which we have now fully embraced. Uh, but how do we gain a wise heart when it comes to the, not just where you go to eat dinner, but the really important decisions of life? How we make sure that when we look back at our lives, uh, we don't think uh, about all that we wish we would have done or, or should have done. Well, whenever there's a problem, and if you were with us in contemporary last week, I shared this in the message, uh, there's uh, a format I have uh, for what to do with worry. And so I want to share that with you, and then we're going to look at how we apply it to time. And uh, when I think, how do I stop worrying about a problem, I think about the word pass. And the first thing I need to do is figure out my purpose. What is my purpose? What is my role? I may not be able to fix the problem. Uh, it might be a situation where what I want to happen ends up happening or whether it ends up not happening, we might win, we might lose. It might go well, it might go poorly. I'm okay with all that. That's life. What I wanna make sure I know is my purpose within it. If I can figure out my purpose, my anxiety and worry is going to go down dramatically because I'm going to figure out what I'm responsible for and what I'm not responsible for. Once I figure out my purpose and my role, I'm going to act. 
And my action might be something that makes a difference in the situation, or I might choose, because I've realized my role, to not act. But I'm going to have a plan for how I'm going to address it. I'll, I'll never be at peace until I have that plan. For instance, uh, recently a, a father in our church pulled me aside and he said, I understand you have a daughter uh, who's getting close to adolescence. And I said, yes, I, I, I do. And he said, I, I have three of them. I want to give you some advice. There are going to be times when your wife and your daughter have disagreements and I want you to know the best way to handle that as a father. So I got out my notepad and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. You know, to hit me with this wisdom. He's like, if that happens, go to your room. And I'm like, unless they're in your room, go to your, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm in my room. What do I do now? He goes, stay there. They'll come get you when it's safe to come out. You just stay, don't insert yourself. They're going to handle it just fine, Right. Some situations we might act, some situations we need to jump in and fix, other times we might not, but we always need a plan to figure out our role within it. Once we have that plan and we're carrying out that plan, we surrender in prayer to God. And this is where we say, God, the victory is yours, the defeat is yours, in your hand uh, is our wins and losses, is this going well or going poorly? I trust even if it goes poorly that you will somehow over time redeem that for your glory. If it goes well, I'll, I'll give you thanks, but I just surrender it all to you. It, it, it's all yours, Lord. And this is often where we, in, within the course of working through an issue, this is where we begin to feel the peace. This is when, when we begin to feel that peace. We, we might be working through it the right way. We might not feel it until about this moment. And then after that, we go shine. We, we go shine. Do you remember when, when Jesus said, uh, you know, you are the light of the world. Uh, no one after lighting a lamp places it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand so it gives light to all in the house. Uh, we don't let that issue that isn't completely resolved uh, keep us just constantly worried, constantly living in fear, preventing ourselves from ever enjoying anything good about life. No, we go shine. We go live a life of joy and a life of peace and we trust that God has that. And we, we, we've given it to God and, and we don't have to make ourselves miserable. We, we, we go shine. We, we live the life and enjoy all the blessings that God desires and God has for us. That's, that, that's how we handle any problem that, that we worry about. So how do we apply that to time? How do we, I, I think the first step, a step recognized by Psalm 90, when Psalm 90 talks about how many years we're given and, you know, seeking a wise heart, is that we recognize God has given us all the time we need. God has given you all the time you need. And in fact, uh, time is one of God's greatest gifts to us. You know, physicists will tell you that time along with space was actually created. And I can't wrap my head around that. I can't wrap my head around a time before there was time. But if you work in Oak Ridge and you'd like to take a shot in explaining it to me on the way out the door, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to hear your explanation. But in essence, they are describing scientifically what we believe the, theologically, uh, that there was a time before anything was. And, and that God created time. And we're fascinated by movies where you can go back in time. And, you know, I, I'm still waiting for those of you who are Back to the Future fans. There's all this talk now about electric vehicles. I have no idea why we haven't looked into the flux capacitor. I think that could be a real solution uh, to our energy issues. Um, for some of you, that's really funny. For others of you, you should watch Back to the Future. Uh, but... We, we look at this and we, we know that God has created this world in such a way that we are constantly looking back into time, but we can never go back. If you get a telescope, even with your naked eye, you can see stars that are tens of thousands of light years away and you're seeing what they looked like 10,000 years ago. When you look at the sky, you can literally see back in time because of how long it took that light to get here but you can never go back. And because we can never go back, that's actually one of God's greatest gifts. It means our time has eternal significance. God can redeem uh, wrongs we've done. Uh, God can forgive 
But each moment in time is eternally significant because we don't get it again. Because the consequences of how we spend or don't spend our time, they're real and, and they're lasting. So it's a gift God's given us which gives our lives eternal significance. And we should also recognize that God's given us enough for, to accomplish the significance for which he created us. Uh, no matter how many years we have, he's, he's given us enough. I think about Jesus' life. Jesus lived about 33 years. And of those 33 years, he was only a public figure of any type of influence for at most three years, perhaps less, less than that, depending on how you count the time, the how you order the ways that the Gospels tell us about the calendar in the days of his teachings. Uh, at ve the very most, uh, he was a public figure for, for three years. And yet, even by secular historical standards, he lived the most consequential life in human history. Uh, we, we know there's, there's just enough time for the things that really need to be done. There's there, there, there's enough of it. Uh, I had an experience recently that drove this point home to me. Uh, last Friday, uh, a, a good friend of mine, she was 62 years of age, seemed to be the picture of health, uh, passed away suddenly, just found un, unresponsive. She was, she was a fitness instructor, passed away at, at 62. I was good friends with her and her husband. Her husband taught me how to ride road bikes. And he taught me how to fix road bikes when I crashed road bikes. And, and he, he and I spent, spent a lot of time together se several years back, but we had moved and we hadn't seen them in probably fi five or six years. And, and I got word about, about what had happened. Uh, and I thought, there's, I, I found out that the services were going to be this past Monday. And I thought, there's no way there's enough time for me to go. There's, there, 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 there's just no way. It was uh, one, one of our um, busiest uh, times of the year here at church. Uh, with back to school, it was one of the busiest weeks in my, my family's life. Uh, I, that, I, already that Monday, I was playing in the church's Habitat for Humanity golf tournament that, that morning. And I, I want to tell you, I just, I, my team, like, it, was, it was such a great morning. Uh, you know, uh, of everybody, we scored the highest. I think that's good, right? I, I, I think that's good. But I just said, I, 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 I can't do it. And so I was going to make a phone call. And I was probably going to make a, a memorial gift. And then I had some really important people, some co-workers here at church, and my wife pull me aside and say, if you want to go to that, if you feel like you might need to be there, you just need to go. Everything else is going to take care of itself. You just need to go. There's going to be enough time. So I hopped in, in my car. I drove three hours up and three hours back, six hours uh, to stand in line and spend about 60 seconds with my friend Randy, uh, who just lost his wife. And most of what I said in those 60 seconds, what we said to each other, are the standard stuff that'll never be remembered. Uh, I'm so sorry. We're here for you. If you need anything, call us. That, the, the kind of stuff, you, just the kind of stuff you say. But for the first 20 seconds, I saw him. He just held me. And I don't think we'd ever embraced before. And he just kept repeating, I can't believe you came. I can't believe you came. I'll take that to my grave with me, getting to spend those 60 seconds. And amazingly enough, everything else that was so pressing that needed to be taken care of, it, it was able to be taken care of. God has given us the time we, we need. And yet we find ourselves stressed out for how to use that time. And some of it is external. Uh, today, we, we live in a world of competing cultural calendars, right? There, there are all kinds of calendars out there. There's the, the church calendar. Pastor Mike Stallings does a wonderful presentation for our confirmation class on the church calendar every year. You should attend sometime. It's fascinating. Um, there's the Knox County School calendar, 
uh, which for, for some of us families, you know, is uh, second only to the Ten Commandments involved in the Bible and to how much influence it, it has on our lives. I had a friend, I just got to tell you this, this is just an aside, this is free. Um, he was so excited because his last kids graduated high school and he's like, I'm free from the Knox County calendar. And like the next year, his wife was like, now that her kids are gone, I got to get, I, I just got to get out of the home and she got a job with Knox County. And <laughs> And I, I just love rubbing that in his face every, every time I see him. So we've got like the Knox County calendar. Uh, we, we've got, you know, sport calendars, extracurricular calendars. Uh, we've, we've got our social calendars uh, with, with our friends and, and the places uh, we, we like to frequent. We've, we've got work calendars. A and used to there was more agreement on how these calendars should work together. Y used to, uh, chick, chick, I mean, Chick-fil-A wouldn't have been, uh, you know, seen as different by being closed on Sunday several years back, right? Uh, that's, that would have been what, what, what everybody did. You know, you, you better get your grocery shopping done on, on Saturday. And goodness gracious, nobody's going to schedule a ball game or a program on Wednesday night because that's church night. I remember I grew up across town. I remember uh, as an elementary school student in Fountain City, there was this big deal because uh, there was a rain out in the local Little League baseball uh, tournament and they chose to play the makeup game on Sunday. And the bit, it was like three o'clock Sunday. Like, uh, you know, what wasn't during worship time, wasn't during Sunday evening time, but it, it was a big deal. I remember people talked about it, and particularly it was controversial because my father was the assistant coach. And the talk was, would the pastor go to the game on Sunday afternoon? And I remember my dad showing up, and I remember us getting out of the car, and I, I can remember him saying to me, he didn't give any long theological speech uh, about what was going on. He just said, well, well, if they're going to make us play a game on Sunday, I guess we should go ahead and win it. It's like, okay. Oh, 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 okay, Dad. But we have now, you know, there's not that anymore. We've got all these competing calendars. And we've got, you know, some of us work from home and our businesses tell us, you can do your work anytime you want to, which is great unless you have problems ordering your time, right? Here's the deal. And this surprised me. In the United States, they do a survey every year and they ask people, uh, do you feel like you have enough hours in the day? Do you know that uh, the responses have stayed remarkably consistent over the decades? About 50%. About 50%. This year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but apparently what we do with our calendars has more to do with who we are than just the outside forces acting upon us. And here's what I've learned, and I see this in the life of Jesus. If you don't set your calendar according to your priorities, your calendar will set your priorities for you. And in Jesus' life, we see that he had an agenda. He had priorities. Sometimes he'd be in one town and the people would want more from him and he'd say, you know what, it's time to get in the boat. We're going to the other side of the lake. Or sometimes the crowds would, would want more from him and he'd say, you know what, we... We just need, we need to retreat. We got to get away. I'm going to go pray for, for, for a while. He had this idea of what he was all about. And what I find is that uh, no one, uh, you know, everyone will tell me to uh, put this event, that event, this, that, whatever it might be on my calendar. Nobody's going to worry about how it all fits together but me. Nobody's going to worry about that but you. And the most helpful thing I, I've done recently, uh, and I've, I used to find I had to do this every three to four years, anymore I'm having to do it every year to six months, is take my calendar and take everything off of it and start again. And say, okay, if I were starting from scratch, how could I do what's most important? And put all that stuff on there and then say, okay, now anything else can fit into these other times because we've got the most important stuff on there. When you're looking for that most important stuff, what does the Bible teach? What's the first, one well, of the first commandments God gives? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Are you making time to worship each week? Jesus worshiped each week. Uh, perhaps we need to also. Are you making time to worship each day with enough time to read the Bible for a few minutes and pray and intentionally, consciously seek God? Uh, are, are we doing those 
are we making time for the most important people in our lives? And when we have that time with them, are we giving them our attention? Uh, are we making the time that we, we have to for work uh, and that we have to uh, for the, the fun things God's put in our life that help our body be healthy? And then after that, there's time. There, more time is great. But making sure that we put first things first. So I'd encourage you to do that if you're struggling with time today, if you're worried about time. Take everything off the calendar and, and start again. And just keep on doing that until you get a sense of where your priorities are and where, where God's leading you. Because what I can tell you, if we can do that, then we can surrender the results to God. And we can trust that God accomplishes God's purposes in God's time. This is, this is just what God does, right? God, God gives enough time for what needs to happen to happen. Uh, I was reminded of this this week. Some of y'all saw a viral video that went around the internet. Apparently right now they're playing the Little League World Series. And a pitcher from some team I don't know was pitching against some other team I don't know in some city I'm not familiar with. But somehow it was on national television. And I can't imagine what it must be like for an 11 or 12-year-old kid to be on national television competing in a sport. It must feel like the biggest moment, you know, that, that life could possibly bring. And the pitcher in the first inning of a game threw a pitch, and he threw it hard, and it hit another child in the face. And uh, it looked like the child was hurt badly. Turned out it uh, was not serious. The batter was allowed to stay in the game. He went to first base. And then it became apparent that the pitcher was very shaken up by how close he came to, to seriously hurting another competitor. And they show the, the base runner calls timeout and he walks to the mound and he hugs the pitcher, right? And I have seen that video flash across my YouTube, flash across my, my Facebook. People have brought me their phones, you know, and they're like, hey, you gotta see this. And you know what? I've probably watched it 20 times now. I have no idea who won. I don't know who won that game. I don't know how any of it came out. I know that God had a different agenda for that time. And because that child took time, he made a big difference for a lot of people. God will accomplish God's purposes in God's time. We had a family here at the church a few weeks ago. Uh, their, the grandmother in the family lived out of town. Uh, and she had a heart attack and was not expect to make it uh, much more than, than a day. And they rushed to the hospital. That, uh, one, one of the daughters lived there where the grandmother lived, uh, but all the others had scattered across the country. So they all rushed to the hospital, and you may have been a part of moments like this. But it was hard to, to get flights, and it was hard to, to make arrangements. And it took about a week uh, for everybody to get there. And amazingly, she held on. And she held on. And in fact, she rallied to the point that they thought she, she might recover. And they began to question if she's able to get out of the hospital, what rehab facility should we go to? And then on Friday, uh, the last grandchild arrived. And she talked to the last grandchild. And she passed away on Sunday. And after Friday, it was apparent all the numbers just went down. And she was peaceful and she was happy. But literally, her body survived what should have been a fatal wound for over a week because God will accomplish what God wants to in God's time. And the most miraculous thing about that story is you probably have one of those in your family. I hear those stories 10, 15, 20 times a year that in those moments, God will, amazing things happen and God will accomplish what God wants to in God's time. And just as a thousand years in God's time are like a second gone, so God can accomplish in one second what we would think would take a thousand years. God will accomplish what God wants to in God's time. Our only job is to give God our time. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your great gift of time. Teach us to give you not only our hearts, but also our calendars. Show us, oh God, what is required of us and show us what is not required of us, uh, that we might live a life of joy and peace, of trust and grace. This is our prayer offered in the name of your Son, our Savior. And we all said together, amen.